to everybody. I think it's going to be a really exciting afternoon. And I'm really looking forward to sharing um, some of our thoughts about the microbiome with you. Okay, so objectives, just a little bit about the uh, potential of the gut microbiota, who's there, and how they may influence our health. Notice, so over the last 10 years, we've really undergone a paradigm switch. So we've gone from viewing microbes as simply killer microbes and out to destroy us, to really fellow travelers. So they're living with us, they have adapted to life with us, and we absolutely need them for our health. And a lot of this has come from new technologies and funding as well. So it used to be the only way to study microbes is you had a microscope and you looked at them, or you grew them on culture and you looked them on a plate and you had really limited information about them. But with the advent of sequencing, so they had all these sequencing machines, so they sequenced the human genome, and then they ran out of sequencing on the human genome, and they had all these machines. So they switched to sequencing microbes instead. And that's when they discovered that we have so many microbes living within us, and they are so diverse and so different from each other that it has led to things like Obama putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the National Microbiome Project, just simply to look at what is living with us and what they are doing. So I want to welcome you to your microbial life. You may not realize it, but you have a particular microbial profile living in your mouth, living in your lungs, obviously on your skin, your genital tract, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and as well as one in the breast milk, and there's also one in placenta, which you may be surprised to find out. And there's emerging role that for these microbes in our health, they alter our physiology, they alter our immune system, they alter our metabolism, and they are associated with all of our chronic diseases that we are suffering from today in Western society. So the concept that the microbiome is a new organ that we can manipulate to help improve human health. Okay, remember back in your biology, there's a lot of bacteria in the world. 50 phyla, but only about six phyla are living within us, so they have adapted to life with us. And these are called, bacteroides and firmicutes are the main ones living with us. 100 trillion organisms, bacteria, fungi, viruses. And if you look at the genomic potential of these bugs, human genome, we have 23,000 genes. The microbiome has a million genes. So the number of genes is really dwarfing our human potential. And just a little bit about how they're located along the gut. So you have some in the stomach and some in the mouth that have adapted to life with oxygen and the stomach with acid. But as you move down the small intestine and into the colon, you're moving from a very oxygen-rich environment to an no oxygen in the colon. So in the colon, you have all of these anaerobes. In the small intestine, you have more aerotolerant organisms. And as well, when you get into the colon, there's some that are living just free-floating in the lumen. There's some that are living in mucus, and there's some that come right close to epithelial cells. So a difference along the GI tract and a difference spatially along the GI tract as well. And there's really a fine balance because the commensals that we need for health, they act, they help inhibit pathogen growth. So we have a salmonella coming through. He can't get a foothold because of the commensals that are living there. They convert prodrugs to active metabolites. They degrade plant polysaccharides, produce short-chain fatty acids. They stimulate and modulate immune function. They regulate body fat storage. They maintain barrier function and help with tissue repair. And they also stimulate gut motility. So very important functions that these microbes that are living with us are doing for us. But at the same time, there's pathogens that obviously cause sepsis, infections, inflammation, damage. So it's a balance. The other thing you have to remember is that bacteria are really different genetically from each other. 
So if you take it back to Rhodes Vigilis and an E. coli, they share 40% of genes. That's not a lot of genes. If you take a nematode and a human, we share 40% of genes. So bacteria are really different. They do very, very different things. So if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you're going to have bacteria that can metabolize carbohydrates. If you eat a lot of protein, you will feed microbes that can degrade protein. So you, by your diet and your environment, will select microbes that have the metabolic capacity to deal with what you are eating. So how do they interact with the host? Going back to the gut, just a little bit of physiology for you. A single layer of epithelial cells lines the entire GI tract. Above that is a very thick mucus layer of which microbes will live in the top of the mucus layer. But the mucus layer stops the microbes from coming in direct contact. But the metabolites produced by bacteria come through the mucus and affect the epithelial cells. Right below the epithelial cells are all the cells of the immune system. The immune system cells are there to monitor what microbes are present and to monitor for any invasion that may be taking place. The immune system has to respond to pathogens, so it has to create inflammation and attack, but at the same time, the immune system has to deal with a trillion organisms that are sitting right there on the epithelium. So they have developed a balancing act to do this, to maintain tolerance to our commensals. And they do this through communication with a whole host of mechanisms. So if you look at the microbiota, they release metabolites like short-chain fatty acids, acetate, butyrate. We need these things also peptides, polysaccharides, things we're just learning to discover what the microbes are producing. And it's interesting because the epithelial cells have receptors for all of these metabolites, for all of these things that are produced by microbes. And the immune cells also have receptors for all of these metabolites that are being produced by gut microbes. And the immune cells and epithelial cells are releasing things like cytokines and other chemicals that are altering bacterial function. And the bacteria are releasing things that alter immune function and epithelial function. So it's a three-way relationship that's ongoing all the time. Microbes can drive either a pro-inflammatory reaction or they can drive an anti-inflammatory reaction through all of these communicating metabolites. So that means if you, say, eat a very high refined diet, you will stimulate the growth of certain microbes that have inflammatory potential, and you will drive a low-grade inflammation in your intestinal tract. On the other hand, if you eat things like a lot of prebiotics, a lot of fiber, you will stimulate the growth of microbes that have a more anti-inflammatory effect. So again, what you put in your body will drive what microbes can survive, and those microbes will then drive your immune system to a certain profile. Okay, well, just a little bit about diet. So diet, lifestyle, genetics, environmental factors all modulate the microbiota. Okay, this is an interesting, I just wanted to show you this. Generally, once you get to an adult, you're a healthy adult, you've established your microbiome, it tends to stay constant, but it can be perturbed. This is some data from two subjects. So they took a sample of their stool every day for a year. Okay, think of this experiment now. Okay, so every day for a year they collected it, they wrote down what they ate, what they did, and then they sequenced every day after. So when you're looking at these things, if you look at the top, the different colors are a different class of bacteria. So in subject A, the blue bacteria are a bacteroides, and you can see he's got a lot, not that much, and the purple are a firmicute. So you can see he looks kind of stable throughout, and he's got a little bit of actinobacteria at the top, and the yellow and the red. 
If you look at subject B, he looks different than subject A. They're both healthy males, no difference. But he has a very different profile. He's got a lot more bacteroides in the blue and a lot less firmicutes in the purple. But I want to draw your attention to two things that happen to these individuals. So this guy up here, he went traveling. So he went to uh, Asia, and this guy, he got a salmonella infection. So what happened over the microbiome when they got those infections? So subject A, if you look at the top orange, he had 60% relative abundance of this particular group of microbes. When he went to Asia, changed his diet, had a little bit of diarrheal disease, he completely lost that orange group of microbes. It went down when he came back to North America, went back to his normal diet, the orange group came back, but it didn't come back to where it was. And now he's got a different ratio of particular organisms within his system. Where if you look at sample B, so he got a salmonella infection. If you look at the dark blue there, which is a butyrate producer, he completely lost those organisms during his salmonella infection. They did not come back after the infection. Whereas if you look at the orange, he had very few of those organisms. They outgrew during the infection, and now he's got a new stable microbiome that the infection caused. So lots of times a patient will say that they had a diarrheal illness and now they've got IBS. So, did you have a question? Whether it was the antibiotics or the infection? Probably both. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the other thing you have to remember is that dietary compounds serve as substrate for the bacteria. So whatever you feed your bacteria, they take them, they make metabolites, and they go systemically. So again, the metabolites produced by the bacteria based on what you're feeding them go systemically. And if you look at the plasma metabolites, they differ very significantly between, these are the omnivores and vegans. And again, what is running around in your system comes from bacterial host metabolism. So the interesting thing is that, okay, so diet plus host equals metabolites. These metabolites can act as signaling molecules for the immune system and epithelial cells. They can also act as metabolism. And you'll see a lot during the afternoon about how this works. Okay, just a little bit about gut dysbiosis, human disease. You're gonna hear a lot about this. Low diversity imbalances in gut microbiota are associated with disease. Now in health, it's a rainforest. A lot of different organisms are present, it's very stable. When you get disease, it's a low biodiversity, it's unstable, and you get outgrowth of certain organisms. And just to give you an idea, you're going to hear a lot about gut di diversity. What is it? It means that when you measure the gut bacteria, you get a lot of different species. So if you look at the average diversity association, each one of those little colored balls is a bacteria, a different bacteria. High diversity means you've got a lot of them. Low diversity means you only have a few, and they're outgrowing the other ones. And when we talk about dysbiosis, that means either an increase in inflammatory type of organisms or a decrease in things like short-chain fatty acid producers. And this can happen either by an outgrowth of one or loss of another. So this is a dysbiosis, this is a low diversity. And when you lose these certain bacteria that release metabolites that we need to monitor or to modulate our immune system, you lose this modulating factor over the immune system. And now you can start inducing inflammation and you're going to have more of a pro-inflammatory environment. The other thing is we absolutely need integrated microbial metabolism for health. 
So that means one bacteria produces a metabolite that's used by a second bacteria that's used by a third bacteria to produce the metabolite we need for health. So in disease, when you lose some of these, you've lost the ability to produce a whole host of metabolites that we absolutely need. I'll give you an example of butyrate. Butyrate is absolutely critical for colonocyte health. It's critical for immune modulation. To produce butyrate, you need an organism that produces lactate and acetate. Because the organisms that produce butyrate can't do it without lactate and acetate. So in other words, you need three different types of bacteria to end up producing butyrate. And if you lose butyrate producers, you lose a signal that stimulates mucus production, you lose a signal that produces secretory IgA, which you absolutely need for protection. Butyrate helps in tissue repair, and again, immune modulating. So if we lose butyrate producers, we lose all of these benefits in the gut. Okay, so gut ecosystem destruction, how do we fix it if it's there? Okay, antibiotics, you're gonna hear a lot about antibiotics kill a whole lot of things. Probiotics, giving back live organisms. Prebiotics, food substances, we're gonna hear a lot about prebiotics. Diet, you can change activity. And fecal transplants, where you can change the entire ecosystem. And again, we're gonna be hearing about this. Restoring an ecosystem is what our gut is, and this is how we have to approach it. Either by seeding it, by complete recovery, or by producing new organisms. So again, coming back to manipulating the gut microbiota, which is where this whole field is going, how can we manipulate it to health? So fecal transplants on the far end, giving everything back, very complex when you're giving a fecal transplant, we'll hear a lot about that. We Going towards a consortium where we may combine a lactate producer, an acetate producer, and a butyrate producer in a defined consortium of five or six strains to maybe push the microbiota towards the anti-inflammatory type of profile. Single strain is a probiotic. And again, we also are looking at using bioactive metabolites that have been identified as having a role and just giving those back to manipulate the gut microbiota. So kind of that's our general overview. We are a super organism. So we live with our bacteria. They have adapted to life with us. They highly modulate all of our functions. So we have to think about now keeping them healthy and establishing a strong ecosystem that is stable and can withstand insults. And I predict that in the future, your microbiome will be in your chart. Therapy will have to be aimed at both the host and the microbiome. And I think that there'll be a lot of, of looking at how to manipulate the microbiome with diet, probiotics, prebiotics, and other defined metabolites. And also, we'll be hearing a lot about infants Infants need to be colonized with the correct microbiota from birth to help reduce the incidence of long-time chronic autoimmune diseases. And I will end there and welcome any questions. Hello. Is there a quick and efficient way to check uh, bacterial diversity at this point uh, in outpatient care? Is there a quick way to check? Well, I'll say user-friendly and efficient way to check bacterial diversity at this point. To check diversity? Yes. Um, there's no quick way to do it. Mm -hmm. it. It can be done. There's a lot of companies that you can send in your samples to have it sequenced and look in your diversity. Um, all those things are coming. They're, they're coming down the track, and I think within five years, they will be available um, at the bedside at the clinic. But right now, you do have to send it away. It does take about a month. Okay. That's promising. Thank you. Okay. But even if you had that, it's still quite a leap, isn't it, uh, from 
knowing what the stool diversity is to knowing whether that is a cause or an effect. Uh, and so much of the information we currently have is uh, really phenomenology rather than necessarily the kind of sequence of studies that are going to help us to in introduce it into practice. Would yes, thank you, you for bringing us back to reality, Dr. Hunt. <laughs> well, though, I'd, I'd like you to comment on that no, because that is that, th this is the, one of the big okay. challenges of the current frontier, really. Yeah, um, if you think about inflammatory bowel disease, um, which Dr. Fedorik will talk about. It's a vicious cycle because you have an inflammatory reaction that is altering the gut microbes, and then you develop an inflammatory gut microbes and then drives the immune system. So that's why I'm saying that you have to, in my opinion, you're going to have to address both the immune function and the microbiome at the same time because they both drive each other. One last question. Thank you. So, um, I have two questions, actually. One is the transient nature of the recovery of the microbiota. Let's say in the, um, in the slide where uh, you showed um, someone who was traveling, subject A, and his, his or her microbiota recovered when they returned to their usual diet and environment and so on. How long would it have taken, or typically, or is it an individual variation, for that microbiota to come back to its um, previous state? That's my first question. Second question would be as far as your, as the fecal transplants, are those long-term results that you see from fecal transplants or is it, again, transient nature? Because it seems like a very dynamic environment. Yeah, so we're gonna cover uh, this whole session on fecal transplants. So I'll leave that to that speaker. Um, for recovery, it's interesting. So a lot of studies have been done looking at this. Um, it seems about 30% of patients, even after antibiotics or some kind of a, a perturbation, never recover. Um, another 30% will recover within a week to two weeks. Um, and then another maybe 30% will take longer to recover. So we don't know what makes a particular microbiome more resilient and easier to recover than another. But we know that some people are very fast recover and some are not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Karen. A great start.